Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, if you would, you can turn to the book of Luke, uh, just the first chapter. Um, gospel of Luke is the third gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and uh, first chapter, and this is Mary's song. We'll be going through uh, verses 46 through 56 today, okay? So um, let me tell you a story to begin, all right? I was walking once through Old Town uh, in Nazareth, okay? And as I was on a trip to Israel, and as I was walking through these kind of narrow streets um, and entered into this church in Nazareth, I heard this singing going on, a group of, uh, of, of women, a small kind of Franciscan choir of nuns that were singing this song in a garden sanctuary. And I was sort of off in the alcoves of this church, and I was trying to find where this music was coming from. Okay, and so I, uh, I traveled through the, the sanctuary and was looking around, listening, because the music was pretty beautiful that I heard. I can still hear the tune, actually, in my head. Um, and so I finally found the spot. It was this gated garden, and there was a group of, of women in there, and they were singing this song. And it was gorgeous to me. Okay, and so like any other, uh, I was 28 at the time, so like any other 28-year-old, I got out my phone and went to record a video of, uh, of this beautiful singing for posterity's sake. And I was successful in that for about 15 seconds before a motherly-looking nun came over and gave me a stern look of shame uh, and told me that this was not a spectacle, but worship. I, uh, of course, I agreed with her, and I apologized, and then I asked her what these women were singing, because it was in Latin, and I couldn't, I couldn't understand it. And she smiled at me graciously and said in Latin, the Magnificat. The word Magnificat means uh, to magnify, like we talked in our children's sermon, and comes from the first word of Mary's song in the Greek language, my soul magnifies the Lord. These are the words of the first Christmas song ever written. Uh, and they came from the mouth of the mother of God, which is a very strange thing to consider, right? That Jesus uh, uh, had a mother, uh, that Mary was the mother of the fully incarnate yet fully divine Godhead. Now, in our day and age, I think that we, uh, as Protestants, most of us know well the kind of overemphasis of the Catholic Church on the importance of Mary, right? Um, however, I think that probably we, as, uh, as Protestants, kind of go in the opposite direction and make uh, perhaps even a greater mistake and make far too little of her. So today, as part of our series on the songs of Christmas, I would like to consider the mother of our Lord Jesus and the beautiful song of faith that she sings. And it is that. It's exactly that. It is a song of faith. Okay? So let me start by giving you the background information, the context, the greater context of, uh, of the song that she sings, the Magnificat. Okay, so Luke begins by telling us that in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to a town of Nazareth in Galilee to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and the angel went to her and he said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. So this is what we know about Mary. We don't know a lot about her, uh, but we do know some. We know that she was young, for example. Okay, so the scriptures in Luke 1 uh, tell us that she was a virgin, which means somebody who's not sexually active, but it also just means somebody who's young. Okay, uh, and so we know that Mary was a young woman, potentially between the ages of like 16 and 18 or 16 and 20 even. This is when often women would marry in this day and age. Okay, we know that she was also poor. Well, how do you know that, Pastor? 
Uh, well, we know that, actually, because when Mary went after she had Jesus to the temple to make an offering to God after she had given birth, okay, There's a, there was a custom to make an offering to God after you had given birth. The customary offering to be made was a lamb or a goat or something of the sort, right? But the law of Leviticus tells us that if a person did not have enough money to offer a goat or a lamb for that offering, that they could offer a turtle dove, okay? And in Luke, he records that Mary, as she went to, uh, to break, take this offering after her birth to the temple, she brought a turtle dove, okay? So she couldn't afford uh, a normal, uh, the normal kind of sacrifice that would be offered at this time, okay? We also know that she was from a relatively unknown town, the town of Nazareth, which is only famous in our day and age because it's where Jesus lived. But uh, back then, it might be like, uh, you know, like Ismay, Montana, okay? The smallest town in Montana, a whopping 27 people. Or it might just be like living from Montana in general, okay? Uh, kind of an unknown place, kind of mysterious. You're not really sure what people do there or what they're like. You just know it's kind of out there, okay? Uh, we, so we know that she was young, she was poor, and she was unknown. Uh, she was also related to Li Elizabeth and Zechariah, who we talked about last week. She was also engaged to a man named Joseph, who was a descendant of David, uh, an upstanding man in his community and a carpenter. And finally, we know that she knew the scriptures. And here's why I say that she knew the scriptures. Because her song that she sings is uh, almost entirely scriptural quotations that she makes. Okay? Scriptural quotations from various spots in the Bible. But it says, it doesn't say that Mary was prophesying. It doesn't say, like uh, it says about Elizabeth, that the Holy Spirit came upon her. But instead, that she just sang a song. So it was coming from her own heart and soul, and mind, and learnedness of the scriptures. So Mary's a pretty, pretty, pretty neat character. But what you find out is that her day, and potentially her year, and potentially her life, is about to be completely turned upside down. Because the angel doesn't just stop and say, greetings you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. That would be a very nice thing for the angel to say and then take off and go about his business. Mary could go on and say, wow, this is wonderful. That's a great affirmation right before I get uh, married. It's a great affirmation of somebody who's unknown and somebody who's poor. I really think it's nice that God came uh, through an angel and said that I, I'm highly favored. That would be lovely. But uh, the angel has more information for her. He says to her that she will be the mother of God, that she is going to bear a child inside of her, uh, and that child will be known as the Son of God. Mary, as you can imagine, as, and as anybody else in the world would, uh, would say, she asked, well, how is that going to happen, right? Since I'm a virgin, I'm not married to anybody. And the angel explains that it will be by the Holy Spirit that she will conceive this child, and he will be the Savior, the Son of God to the world. And then he closes, the angel does, by telling her, he says, is there anything uh, too incredible or too wonderful for God to do? And Mary, in a beautiful show of obedience and honor to the Lord, says, may it be, I am the Lord's servant. Now, if you just imagine it, you get that news. Uh, in, in that day, your life has just been completely turned upside down, okay? It's turned upside down because you weren't planning on it. Uh, it's turned upside down because you weren't expecting it. It's turned upside down because over the nine months that you bear this child, you're walking through uh, the towns and villages, and people are saying, oh, I thought that she was supposed to be married next month. What's happened? She's got a, a bump underneath her... Have you... She must be... She must be kind of a questionable woman. Right? I mean, you can imagine the rumors passing from here to there, the judgments being made by passerbys on the streets. 
okay? And Mary had to endure all of that. And then on top of that, she had to raise the Son of God which is, I mean, it has to be one of the most daunting things ever. It's like, you know, she loses the, her child, Jesus, at one point in time, uh, leaves him at the temple on a family trip. Can you imagine doing that as, as the mother of God, the, the inadequacy that you would feel as you raise this child, as you're walking home and you realize, oh my goodness, I left Jesus, God's son, Back in Jerusalem, accidentally. I'm the worst mother of all time, right? Or any mistake, any loss of temper, uh, any, uh, any, uh, any mistake that you would ever made would just be magnified by, by your son, who is completely perfect, <laughs> who you're called to raise. It's a great and awesome task. And the reason that I give you uh, the context of Mary's song is because it makes the song that she sings so much more wonderful in my mind, actually. Because it's not a song of lament. It's not a song of worry. It's not a song of anxiety or how are we going to make ends meet or what are people going to think of me. But it is sheerly a song of praise for God's magnificence and work in her life. Which I think just makes it all, all the more beautiful in my mind. So I want to go through and I want to highlight just some key features from Mary's song that she sings. You'll notice that as she goes through, she's highlighting over and over and over again the wonderful characteristics of who God is. Okay? So this is, uh, this is how she starts. She said, my soul glorifies or magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. She doesn't see God as somebody who's turned her schedule upside down, who has done her wrong. She doesn't say that God has given her too much for her to carry or that it is too wonderful or magnificent for her to bear. But she says, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. The one who saves us, the one who walks with us, the one who even when our schedules and our ideas and our hopes and dreams and plans are turned upside down, is working for our salvation in our lives. I think it's a wonderful response that, uh, that she makes. Oftentimes in our lives, when plans don't go as we wish they would, or when things don't work out as we had planned, we can get sort of grumpy about it. You know, I, I, I myself, if something gets kind of thrown off in my day, uh, I can get all in a, a tissy about the whole thing. Right? But instead to pause and see, maybe a change of plans, maybe an inconvenience is actually working out for my own benefit, and then I can glorify the Lord in the midst of it and rejoice that God, through all the various events in my life, is working for my salvation. Okay? So she rejoices. She says, my soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. The second thing she says is that God has been mindful of the humble estate of his servant. So she says, for he has been mindful of the humble estate of his servant, and from now on, all generations will call me blessed. Right? That God has been mindful of the humble estate of his servant. And I think that she's not only saying something that's true about uh, her own life, but she's saying something that's true about God in general. That God is not out of mind. That you and I are, are not off of God's radar or something. Okay? But that God is mindful of his people. He knows the humble state that we live in. The struggles that we go through. The sins uh, that break us down and challenge us day in and day out. That God is mindful of those things and cares to work amidst them for our good. Just as he did for Mary. He looked down at somebody who's humble, who is not of, of great or powerful means, who has no strong or uh, so a strong family history or strong uh, life or big bank account or anything. And he looks down and says, I care about that person. I care about you, right? 
And the scriptures are replete with this, okay? They're just filled with this very truth that God has been mindful of the humble estate of his people. Right? You look through scriptures and God is constantly, from Abraham to, uh, to the disciples to Moses, he's constantly choosing and picking a people who are of no special account, right? who aren't the sharpest tools in the shed. He looks at them and says, you, I'm interested in you being my instrument. I'm interested in working in your life. I'm interested in changing and calling and making you mine. Not because you're so great or so wonderful or so awesome, but because, solely because you are so little and small and insignificant. And because that is who I care about. That's God's message. That's God's message to Mary, and it's God's message to each one of us. That he has looked down on the humble estate of you and has said, I want to work in your life through my son Jesus. Not exactly how he works through Mary's life, but nonetheless, in each one of our hearts and lives. Okay? So he's mindful of our humble estate. Also, she says, God, that he is merciful. Uh, I think this is, a, this is a beautiful line. His mercy extends to those who fear him uh, from generation to generation. Okay? That God is merciful to those who fear him. Who, for those who respect him, we've talked a lot about what does the fear of the Lord means. It means to revere and respect and honor and take the position of Mary and say, I'm not too proud. I'm, I'm not a person who doesn't need God in my life. I'm not a person who's strong enough to make it on my own or to pick up my own, myself by my own bootstraps, but somebody who looks to the Lord and says, I'm humble and I need your help in my life, and unless you help me, there's no way I'm going to make it. I don't deserve your love. I don't deserve your affection. I don't deserve your attention. I don't deserve to be called your, your child, but I desire to be. And Mary's message to the world now, you know, 2,000 years later, is that God is merciful to those who fear him, to those who humble themselves before him, uh, that he extends mercy to each one of those people. Next, she says, that God is just, that he has brought down the rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. What does he mean by this? Or what does she mean by this? I think here we get a picture of the way that God works in our world. Um, if you have a problem in your life, right, or if you have a problem in the world, usually we'll, we want to think about the great and powerful ways to deal with it, right? So you think about wars and conflicts and all sorts of things, all these problems in the world. We think like, how can we fix this? And we go to kind of the biggest and greatest and strongest means to do so. But it's, it's a wonder to think about how God saved the world from sin and death and the devil, right? That he didn't do it by sending a great and powerful king. He didn't send his son to be born into royalty or into the most powerful people in the world, but looked down on the most humble uh, and brought justice to those people, right, who, uh, who had been downtrodden in the world. Uh, for those who are too proud or too rich or, too, hung, or too, too filled up to need God, God says you must humble yourself before you come to me. Okay? Uh, but God is judge, and he is the one who lifts up the humble, and he, uh, he is the one who, who, uh, who judges those who would be arrogant towards him. And then finally, uh, she says this. She says, he has helped his servant Israel by remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised to our ancestors. And the point here is that God is one who keeps his promises. Okay? She, she refers back to Abraham and says uh, that he has kept his promise to Abraham and to his seed forever, right? Just as he promised to our ancestors. The reality is, is that Jesus' birth was a long time coming, thousands of years, right? 
God made a promise to Adam and Eve and to Abraham and to Moses and to David and onward for thousands and thousands of years and then finally fulfilled that promise, as the, the Apostle Paul says, at the fullness of time um, and kept his promise for the salvation of many people, right? That he sent his son in the, into the world, not just to be a child, right? But to grow up, uh, to teach, to preach, to heal, to open the eyes of the blind, to open the ears of the deaf, to give life to those who sat in darkness, and also to plunge himself into the darkness as well, that God keeps his promises, that he has kept them in Jesus Christ, and that he will keep them in our lives as well. So Mary's song is about a Savior. It's about a Savior who is mindful to those who fear him. It's about a savior who rules and is judge and is mighty. And it is about a savior who keeps his promises and bets his life and gives his life to keep those promises. Okay? So uh, the question is, can we, as God's people, sing Mary's song in the good situations and in the bad situations, in the difficult situations when life gets turned upside down? Can we hope as Mary hopes? Can we, can we profess as Mary professed? Can we confess our faith in God in the midst of our whole lives, looking to him who keeps his promise? I think by faith and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can, throughout our whole lives, say that our soul in every situation magnifies the Lord and our spirit rejoices in God our Savior. So, as you live out uh, this Christmas and this Advent season, remember Mary's song. May your soul glorify and magnify the Lord. Would you join with me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we pray that through you, the power of your Holy Spirit, we would be people who in our lives and in our words and thoughts and deeds would magnify your name and would rejoice that you are our Savior. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.